of Del Barrio, and he's the founder and CEO of Tiffany Venture Labs, a global fintech venture studio focused on advancing financial inclusion. He also leads by MK across broader digital platform. The lead of startups include Saffron, a sense of finance and early, and are making remarkable strides in global finance services. With a career that includes roles as his chief strategy officer of the PLDT Group and managing director of PLDT Capital, Winston brings over two decades of experience as a tech entrepreneur and venture capital executive. He has to be successful startup ventures in Silicon Valley and experience as a venture capitalist at Intel Corporation. Winston is actively engaged in global forums such as the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council and is recognized as a WEF Young Global Leader. In the UN in the Asia Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation, or APEC, he chairs the policy partnership on science, technology, and innovation. Additionally, he serves on the executive board of the Los Angeles Economic Development Corporation. Winston holds a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Engineering from the Vassal University and has expanded his knowledge through executive courses at prestigious institutions. He's also an accomplished author with best-selling books including Ready or Not, The Six Big Disruptions That Will Change the Way We Do Business, and Ready or Not 2020, which features a present pandemic chapter. So ladies and gentlemen, I bring you Mr. Winston Domanillo. It's an honor for us to become the 151st member of uh, the chamber. Uh, thank you, Celeste, for facilitating that. Um, I always get stage fright when I talk in front of fellow Filipinos, so uh, thank you for having me at this time. Um, what, I, what I'm here to talk about tonight is really uh, our, our like, journey towards uh, building digital companies. So today I'll talk to you about Bayanke, a company we built during the pandemic for in LA and a company that we just built right after the pandemic. And what I'd like to, to do as I talk about these companies is to share with you both the journey that we took, but also all the tools that we were able to wield through the pandemic. And can I share with you some, some success that we've got through Bayani? I'm super proud of that. Bayani Bay is really a, not just a Filipino company, but it's a born in LA company. It's actually, uh, we had the honor of being awarded a built in LA top five company here in Los Angeles. And uh, the other thing that is really making us proud about the end is it's a company built only for Filipinos, by Filipinos. And uh, I want to share with you that, that journey. So, very quick background. Uh, we weren't sure if we should turn off the lights and oh, see the deck or see the We can. Do you prefer? Uh, can you guys see the deck? Yes, I mean, yes, do you prefer to keep it? Right? Yeah. All right, let's keep it that way. So, uh, <laughs> Talino Ventures is the company I run, and Talino Ventures is essentially a company that builds companies. So we're essentially a venture capital firm. We make investments, and we also have a team of 300 here in Los Angeles and in the Philippines that are mostly technologists that build technologies that the startups that we build. So let me just walk you through a super quick background about uh, us and what we've done so far. Do you mind if we turn off the lights? Sure. They, they want to see. It's a 50-50 verdict here, so you will turn it on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, quick background of the new adventures. Uh, we're a company that we've been around for a while. Uh, I started my career at Little Corporation, making venture capital investments. We're among the first in Silicon Valley. Uh, at the time we built this, so uh, Sequoia, Heiner Perkins, uh, these were companies that started venture capital in Silicon Valley, and this is something that was really, really important because it was the first effort that leveled the playing field, right? If you're a geek, no capital, and you can't justify the bank why they should fund you. These were other geeks in Silicon Valley, like HP and Intel, that would take a chance on you. That was kind of the culture around the original set of venture capital, and we did that in Silicon Valley going back. Um, I had an opportunity to um, go on the other side of this and build a few companies as well. Um, here in Los Angeles, uh, in a street called Rose Grants in Manhattan Beach, 
actually built eight companies, and three of them were able to sell to IBM, Red Hat, and Alio. Um, one of the things that the World Economic Forum opened my mind to is that you know you can only make so much money in help. And part of that effort was to go home to the Philippines and to see if we can, um, I could be uh, playing a part in helping something that's important in the Philippines. So I picked two areas of interest. One is telecom. I became the chief strategy officer of PLT Corporation and ran money convenience strategy around the conglomerate, which included um, uh, water, uh, roads, uh, PLT at the time, uh, and all our efforts and investments as well. And then Banco de Oro Bank is the other area that I thought would be a, a, a field where we could level the playing field. So banking and telecom was the two areas that we spent the time on in the Philippines. And it was a great experience. Um, I had just thought that there's something even more fun than maybe rich companies future. Uh, and that is to focus on the human beings that we're trying to serve and build companies and products to them. So that got me to the pandemic. And to me, and what my strong advice to all the uh, uh, emerging startups is that keep your eye out on inflections. And for me, an important event that happened in 2020 was the pandemic. And during the pandemic, one of the rare opportunities we're able to do in the Philippines is to be asked by the government to assist in the government's effort through the pandemic. Uh, we led a volunteer organization called DEFCON, and one of the projects we did was to provide financial and digital technologies to Filipinos that needed a UGA or social amelioration in the Philippines. And the problem we were trying to solve was that there's 8 million Filipinos that, receive, that need to receive aid from the government. And because we weren't quite ready in the Philippines, they had to line up one or two kilometers to get 8,000 pesos. And the government's only way to validate that they got that money was to take a picture with their face and 8,000 faces in front of them. And it was very humanizing. And not very healthy during the pandemic. So, a volunteer team of them with DevCon, a thousand people signed up, we built the technology in three weeks, we deployed it to the largest deployed technology in the Philippines so far in one week, and in one week we signed up four million Filipinos, they got their money digitally, and the lines ended. And to me that was a light bulb moment. That's, that's a time that as an entrepreneur and as a venture capitalist, I realized that the most important thing you can do with technology is to make it available to as many people as possible. And that the Philippines has a lot to offer. So the Philippines actually is number one in microfinance, or number one in microinsurance. Um, we have a lot of technology in the Philippines that we can share with the world. So as I came back to the United States, I took those learnings and took one of a Filipino invention, which is uh, social borrowing in the Philippines, where about eight people borrow money all at the same time, and because there's eight of them, they share the cost of the servicing of the loan, and therefore the interest rates are lower. And because there are eight of them, and they all have to pay together, the repayment rates are really, really high. So it was very successful, and that brought about lower interest rates in the Philippines. And so we brought that here to the United States. We partnered with the American FDIC. Uh, we used that platform as a, uh, a replacement for PPP here in the United States and serve small businesses uh, here in the United States. So that was the genesis of the journey back to America and the journey back to building startups here in the United States. And so far, we have built four startups uh, here in the US. And let me go just quickly share with you the journey we took. Uh, one with Bayani Bay, and then I will share with you what we're doing with Bernie, which is a lot of exciting stuff for us. So next slide, please. So inflection points are very important. Um, when I think about what I've learned at Intel, it's this idea that whatever business you're in, and the way you do and you behave in that business will not last forever. So at Intel, we were extremely successful, but we got to a point where desktop computers have been oversaturated. And Intel actually lost sight of the emerging trend called mobile phones. And so we lost out of that business. And this is what any growth teaches, right? that there is inflection points in any given time in your life. And as a business, if you are not aware of those inflection points, you're headed for an eventual decline. And that's what happened to Intel. Right? 
today, I'm very sad as an Intel employee that NVIDIA, you know, graphics card is, is, a, is a higher market than Intel, right? We didn't only miss mobile phones, we also missed to become the processor for AI or Web3. Um, because we were so enamored with our success. Inflection points are also really important factors to scout opportunities. And for me, I use inflection points to scout opportunities. And what the Nino has seen during the pandemic is it's a point in time that we will all remember that certain things got accelerated. So during the pandemic, at least in our ecosystem, in our universe, three things happened that I believe will fundamentally change the way we do business. First of all, we finally got comfortable with remote work. Okay. Um, there was always a debate whether you are more productive at home or at work. And remote work was a necessity during the pandemic. And it's an opportunity for emerging countries like the Philippines. Because we can now bring our talent wherever you are in the world. So that's a key driver for me in this inflection point. We also saw during the pandemic the acceptance of digital digitization. Everybody always said, oh, we're digital, we have to be digital, we have to be doing this, but never really practiced it. Never really actually accepted it, right? Never really thought that Zoom was just a compliment to how I do work. But a lot of people actually work through Zoom, right? And reinvented the, the work, the way they do work, because it's now not just remote, but sometimes also hybrid. So these are the types of people more and more accepted digitization. And then finally, uh, AI, uh, which is really a byproduct of analytics, machine learning, and then AI, has become a little bit more acceptable to complement and accelerate human capacity. So we finally were a little bit more comfortable in that. And that's, this is kind of this event triggered by COVID and accelerated by technology, in my opinion, creates new businesses. So as a venture capitalist, it's extremely exciting. And as an entrepreneur, it's an, another opportunity to do more of what we love doing, which is to create businesses. And so a few of my latest startups actually got born through, through COVID pandemic. And they're now built differently. And I think their sustainability is also mapped differently. And so let me take you very quickly through the journey, right? So we, uh, first startup that we built uh, through the pandemic is a company called Miami Cable. It started out as a remittance company. It started out because when we talk about remittances, the World Bank states that it's still about 7.5% friction cost. In other words, every single money that a global professional sends home, they use 7.5% of it. That's way too expensive. And companies like Remitly, uh, as an example, pioneer digital remittance. And this is kind of a good first step in making sure that this market is served. But it's just the first step. There's a lot more opportunity in, um, in cross-border payments. And this is where we set up the new by Pay. So factoring in those three things, right? People are now more remote, digitization is now more accepted, and AI is becoming a part of our future. How might we build the company a little bit more differently? So this is the journey we took of yeah, in Miami Bay. Um, next step. So first of all, we realized that we have to change the way business is done. Remittance is expensive because there are five or six middle people in remittance. I have to bring my money to a counter. That cash needs to be transported. Sometimes uh, uh, armored vehicle picks up remittance, sends it to a bank, then it gets transmitted to a foreign exchange uh, agent, then it gets transmitted to a bank in the Philippines, and then it gets to a uh, distribution of it, and say, you are Palawan, and then it goes eventually to the end user. And that's why you do 7.5%. The innovation and the fundamental change introduced here is what if I connect a bank directly to another bank and just remove all the middlemen, right? And all we do is not even play like a remittance company, just be software, right? And all we did here was really became software for the largest Asian bank in the United States, which is East West Bank, with the largest Filipino bank in the Philippines, which is Banco de Oro, right? and we created software for that. 
And so because it's a bank to a bank, it is the most secure way to send money. And because it's a bank to a bank, they produce the best forex. And it's because it's a bank to a bank, right? It gave extra comfort to the different people sending money. But more importantly on the next slide, because we eliminate so many middlemen people in this space, we actually beat, as a startup, right, on year one of our business, we beat every single online remittance company in rates. Right? We were able to offer at zero cost at, at an exchange rate higher than anything else. Up until today, you can check. Um, and that's simply because of innovation. That's simply because we remove pieces along the way. And that's simply because we hyper-focus. We only care about Filipinos. Right? Our technical support line answers in Tagalog or Visaya, however you want them. And they're open 24-7. And you can go in places that are familiar to you, like Cebu City or Baco de Oro to, to get the money. So that's what we call the disruption, right? That, that hits the bottom line of the biggest players where they can't change their, the way they play their business because they're already established. And we're able to come into that uh, strictly out of technology. The other thing that is really exciting is that when you focus to a particular market, you begin to realize that the market is even bigger than you thought. So the Philippines has, we always hear this, $40 million or so $40 billion of remittance to the Philippines. But a lot of people overlook a few things. Number one, it's not just remittance. We're also exporting and we're also taking money back. But even more important than that, and just in the United States itself, Filipino household is the second or third highest earning household here in the country, which means that every single Filipino household makes about $105,000 per year. That means that GDP or the spending power of Filipinos in the United States alone is $100 billion, one third of the Philippine GDP. So that kind of opened much more opportunities for them. And when we looked at the market, we didn't have to win your test. That's kind of an old business. It's like table stakes, right? We just want to be part of it. But we were able to now enable companies like SMDC, Ayala Corporation, LaSalle, Ateneo, FEU, to get paid directly from the United States to the Philippines. And we created a platform where you can now do direct payments from the US bank all the way to these institutions that normally work, people use that money to spend it. And so there's a term in Filipino called open. And what that means is that I'm sending money to my relatives so you can use that money to pay for the loan that I'm supposed to have to pay. And sometimes that money doesn't make it there. And that's oftentimes a problem. And so again, using technology, we're able to connect directly from a bank here in the United States to an institution or um, of a, uh, um, a company in the Philippines quite quickly. And then the other thing that we discovered is that a lot of Filipinos export to the United States. And those Filipinos that export to the United States have very little facility to get paid. Right? They use wires, which is expensive, and they use bank foreign exchange rate, which is low. And so Van Pay kind of started participating into that as well. So it felt like innovation builds products for us. That's the first step, right? If you want to enter the market, you better have something new and exciting and different to offer. But what's really exciting after we started building products that we thought could beat anyone, the next important and difficult thing to do is how do you tell people about it? Right? How do you go about telling people that we have a product that is some, something that everybody needs to take advantage of? And this is where digital comes into play uh, even further. So the first thing we did was we leveraged big brands. We partnered, right? Bayani Pay is a, is a nobody brand three years ago. And so by taking advantage of the fact that when you send your money in the United States, it starts with East West Bank. And they are the largest bank in California and as an Asian bank. And that when you send money home, it will be processed by Banco de Oro, the largest bank in the Philippines. That already kind of gives you the credibility. And then we made it even simpler, where we partnered with Seafood City and about a million people walk into Seafood City every week. And they get to see Bayani Pay all the time. And that works really well. And then that gets us to partner with SNBC. So the other thing that we did was 
Uh, when we launched a product at digital, we did digital all the way, end to end. So we started with a digital product that's marketed using digital means. So we got really good at Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And, and then we manage it digitally. We actually use very advanced analytics and we use machine learning to determine the forks and get, you know, always have the best around and uh, ensure that we adjust the product to our competition. We, we have a rule in our platform that says we always will have the highest forks. And then AI does that, not a person. And so that, uh, that's how you automate the system all the way through. Next thing. And then the other thing that, that is really important when you start thinking of digital is while you are getting ready to go digital, you always want to bridge the physical and the digital. So in this case, what made Miami a, a familiar digital product is the fact that it was a familiar physical product. Right? We started our campaigns in Seawood City. We um, basically uh, was there all the time. We allowed people to go shopping with our technology. And then once they see a familiar face in Seawood City, we then augmented that with digital products. Now, the cool thing about digital platforms is that it will actually completely understand your user if you know how to wield it. So our customers see us all the time. They get reminded every 15th and 30th, right before they send remittance home, that we have the best rates, right? That it is secure and all of that. And so that, that helps us quite a bit. So we had to pay actually when 18,000 customers in 18 months. Uh, we grow 300% year over year. We're looking at growing 10x next year. And this is kind of the power of, of digital. Uh, next slide. And then the other thing that's really cool here is that because of the focus, because of digital, because we know our customers, and this is what AI and analytics can do to you, you can build products and solutions and messages for super authentic. And so these are examples, for instance, of slides where we spend a lot of money um, uh, marketing, and we use analytics to actually determine which one's more effective. So I just want a quick poll, and then have two more slides, and then I'm done. Uh, let me just, by show of hands, who thinks that in this three content, right, we spend a few hundred thousand dollars marketing this? Who thinks um, A is the most effective? Henry? Yeah. Two? A couple people? Three? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Can you wait? Uh, the Mga Pinoy sa America nagpadala na with 160 pesos na pagkakitin. It means that it's. <laughs> it means that it's. Uh, it's. It's easier to send uh, at the higher. And then the second is kind of. So the first is an archetype of your mom, right? The second is an archetype of um, a nurse, a oh, um, predominant sender of of remittance and utilities. And the third is more like, let me convince you it's cheaper. So what's interesting is that my team never thought. That A was the best one, but it is the best one. And without analytics, we wouldn't know that. And a lot of our apps today actually is driven by analytics. And, and that's kind of a good example of that. I'm going to end with this last slide and say that a familiar face is always, when you do a lot of digital, always remember that a familiar face always drives a home. Right? And combining our ability to partner with Banco de Oro and being able to bring a familiar face. This is actually one of the secrets of success of Miami Pay. So many people realize that. Let's talk a little bit about something else. Good news. I have 60 pesos for a dollar. I need that money for the money. For the first time, you are being able to get to Miami Pay. You got to buy me that. I have a key. Enjoy this. Where's the problem? Sign it up. So Miami Pay is not wrong. And then, we will find a place. And then just part of the video side. So um, I know I'm out of time, so I'm just gonna truncate this pretty quickly. But I just want to share with you that um, when you build companies these days, you gotta think of something else, real digital technologies. And uh, even an old boring business like your business, you can resurrect and make it exciting. And uh, uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you all for having me.